Hi, this is Jessica DeMassa, and I'm here at the Guidewell Insights Lounge at Singularity University's Exponential Medicine. Joining me is a panel um, of some wonderful guests who just finished talking about social determinants of health, health disparity, health literacy, and a number of other things that we can't wait to get into. But before we get into that, I want to introduce everybody to you. Um, we have Dr. Lee Sanders here. He is an associate professor from Stanford um, in pediatrics, I should say that. Uh, we have Dr. Gloria Wilder, who's the CEO of Core Health. Welcome. And we have Josh Lee, who's a principal with Deloitte. So um, I want to kick off the conversation. I'm going to start with Josh. Um, so, Talk, talking from a macro point of view about social determinants of health, it's something that touches basically every conversation we're having here at XMED, and people are looking for different ways to integrate the exponential technologies to help impact this. But I guess where I want to start our conversation, and you guys can jump on it, is how hospitals, how large health systems, and how um, basically these larger healthcare organizations can really invest in addressing this, the social needs of the healthcare of the population of patients that are looking for care? Well, it's, thank you for starting with that. Um, it's an interesting question that the three of us really wrestled with when we were designing this panel because it is one of these topics that's everywhere. Everybody's talking about it, but even just trying to get some definitions straight that we could share with that audience wasn't easy. Uh, there are yeah. lots of different ways of defining even what we're talking about. Um, we recently completed a research study that surveyed hospital systems about how they're looking at the social determinants and what they're doing. And there are a couple of pretty interesting findings. You know, one is that there was broad agreement that the health systems need to do something. 80% said it was part of their mission and their strategy. Only about 40% of them said they knew how to do it. Okay. So there's this real gap right and now. And I want to ask you real quick, just to clarify for everybody, which social determinants are we talking about exactly? Well, we had a great team as had soon a great as you debate. said it, and we Gloria, started debating about this. Would you like so, to share your definition? So, so when you think Sorry. about the social determinants, there's food insecurity for patients, right? Who, patients or, or residents of a community who don't have access to food each day, right? There is housing, right? Housing directly impacts uh, some diseases like asthma, COPD, right? But, but for everybody, you need quality housing. Homelessness is a big issue. There's income inequality, right? Can somebody actually support themselves within the community? Can they actually pay for their medications or their co-pays, right? Even when they're working a full-time job, right? There's transportation as a barrier for a lot of people. And people think that that's just in rural areas, but transportation is a barrier in urban markets too, right? Where people don't have access, right? And then there are things like legal services, right? Access to, to both criminal and civil justice within a community. You might not think that has a huge impact on, on health, but it does. If you're living in a violent community, right, that's going to impact your health every day. Even if you're not the one who suffers the trauma directly, just being around the trauma, yeah, impacts your health. So social determinants of health is very broad, but it's very real in all of our lives when we think about it. And I'm going to stop you real quick right there, Gloria, because I want to go back to Josh real yeah. quick so we can finish this point that I interrupted. So <laughs> the hospitals want to do something about it, but don't know how. And don't when you how. hear Gloria's definition of this, I can see where they would be a little bit lost. So yeah. what have you guys found out? What do you recommend? Well, so one of the interesting things about this, so we get into this debate of, you know, it sounds like a lot. It, it's That's not what we're used to doing in the confines of the hospital walls. So whose responsibility is it really in our society to address social determinants? One of the interesting things we just did on the panel was we showed uh, a quote from the Hippocratic Oath, which every doctor needs to swear before mm -hmm. they yeah. can practice medicine. And there's a line in there that's pretty clear. It says, prevention is preferable to cure. Uh, I don't think it could be any clearer. Um, and I often find that we need to go back to the healthcare industry and kind of wave that, right. maybe start right. waving the Hippocratic exactly. Oath around Primary a little bit. prevention, because right now we're a disease maintenance system. We're not a healthcare system in the United yeah. States. And we practice secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, but we really don't pay for a lot of primary prevention in healthcare. When you compare the amount of dollars that we spend on secondary and tertiary, and what that means is we're letting people get sick before we actually intercede. Yeah, I mean, another way of looking at that is it's often said the zip code is more important than your genetic code in determining Talk your outcomes. Talk more about that. Well, you know, we, the studies suggest that more than 50% of your health outcomes are 
determined by these social factors, the housing. More than 50. More than 50 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where you live. And not just where you live, where you lived when you were born, where you lived when you were 16 years old, and where you live now. And it's because of these moderating factors that Gloria described before. Uh, but we spend well over 80 percent of our health care dollar in medical care, which determines at most 15 percent of individual health outcomes. But, I, but I, one of the points I was trying to make before is also that it's not health care versus preventive care. It's not disease treatment versus preventive care. It's an elastic relationship. And what we're really trying to do is to get things out there that work. And, and it's these preventive measures, the vaccines, the screening, the basic nutrition that we know works. Yeah. It's, it's just that everybody has have access to it. So this is an interesting conversation to have yeah. at XMED because yeah, right, this is right. one of those conferences yeah. that I would argue there isn't another one that flirts so dangerously on the bleeding edge of technology. And yeah. yet here we are having a conversation about basic things like nutrition and how are we talking to patients about their care, vocabulary. Yeah. So where does the technology fit in in helping ad advance what needs to be done in order to help? So let me, let me jump in on that. I, I actually think nutrition is technology. Hmm. Delivering clear health communication messages is a type of technology. It's just that it's not information technology. <laughs> it's not new technology. Some of it's old technology, sure. but it works. Yeah. And I think, I think we need to develop technologies that help us scale that old tech. Um, and that's why I was calling for public health technology. Okay. I, I do research, for yeah. example, in health literacy. One in three US adults are unable to read and use basic health information, but more than 80% of the information we're putting out, out there right now is too complex for most of yes. us to understand. And, and from a practical standpoint, people need food where they are, right? And when we talk about technology, yeah. right, developing apps and developing the ability for folks to order healthy foods and have those foods delivered to them even if they're not middle or upper income. Mm -hmm. That is already available to those of us who are middle or upper income. The challenge for folks who are impoverished is that their dollar doesn't go as far as our sure. dollar. And that's where technology comes in, all right? Real innovation around how can we have community gardens where food is grown locally and actually gets to the door of those community residents, right? So if somebody is in a bed in an apartment building on the 15th floor, they can get a fresh food delivery if they need it. Right, Amazon, right now we depend. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. Right. Amazon. 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 What do you mean when you say we? I mean all of us, all of us in the U.S., right? So patients, the, providers, exactly, health system, patients, everybody. providers, and this is this is in the past we've talked about this as very political issues, sure. right, around social justice and things like that. But the truth is, there is a direct return on investment for making sure that a community that is born healthy, I'm a pediatrician, right, stays healthy, right, and that we focus our dollars on those who have a genetic disorder or another thing that. Trauma happens. It can happen to any of us. Sure. And just, right, but just, to, just to throw in a data yeah. point that really, I think, backs up what Gloria's saying. One of the things we showed in the panel tonight was an international comparison of our country versus others. And how do we stack up? Well, not good. <laughs> uh, it's not a good picture. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. No. Uh, we spend the most per capita of any of the 11 wealthiest countries in the world, uh, about $10,000 per person. Uh, that's about 30% higher than the other 10 wealthiest wow. countries. And yet, we are in last place in terms of life expectancy and quality of our healthcare system. Right. So it's not for lack of money that we're getting these poor right. outcomes. No, and I think it's really interesting because you're, I've heard this study brought up before, and there's always this like moment where people are surprised, like, right. what? Right. How can this be? Exactly. We're in the greatest country in the world, right? And, exactly. it, and it, I mean, really, it, it, the numbers don't lie. No, right. right. Numbers exactly. don't lie. And and that means that we actually don't need to invest more money, we no. just actually spend need to spend it differently. Smart, smarter. Smarter, smarter. Smarter. smarter investment. Yeah, exactly. So what would be a smart investment? I'd like to hear, we'll, we'll end on that question. So what would be a smart investment in terms of, of helping, you know, alleviate this and helping kind of flip that so yeah. that we are spending the most, but we're getting the best yeah. outcomes. So we're spending less and getting better outcomes. Yeah, we need real innovation in healthcare, right? 
We That's need a loaded true. statement right. here at this I, conference, I know. so you better Believe clarify. Me, I'm, I'm a champion of innovation. And, and what I mean is actually getting care at the point that somebody needs it instead of expecting that people will come to yeah. large institutions or to, to, to large centers. We've got to get the care more mobile. And we're in a mobile time, mm -hmm. right, in the United States and around the world. Well, we're in a global society. We need to take advantage of that and connect the dots, yeah. right? Connect the dots between a person who gets evicted today and a housing opportunity that's available tomorrow. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. People should not be using the old sources of looking through the phone a, book. a phone <laughs> book. Right. So this is ridiculous. <laughs> right. And that's where we, we, we can innovate in yeah. medicine, right? And then and then there's innovation around how people perceive this. We need to innovate policy, right? Yeah. So that we're no longer working in silos. Housing policies, housing budgets should work with healthcare budgets, mm -hmm. right? to make sure that we're spending a dollar in a community on everybody and spending it well, right? Instead of what we do right now, which is silo, right? The right. healthcare people, we spend the healthcare money, housing people spend the housing money, food people spend right. the food money. And we're money. not gonna share. Yeah. And we're so, not gonna so share. We're, we're building, uh, <laughs> it, take it, we're both pediatricians. Yeah. We're building an innovation lab at, at Stanford for child health equity. And we're asking exactly that question. Yeah. So based on the data that we know, we know that there's return on investment early, prenatal care, early childhood nutrition and development, but all along the life course, there's there's return on investment for these yeah. preventive maneuvers. And what we want to do is is invest them in things that work. So, so two of our large um, investments are in public policy, research and investment in public policies that already work, um, early nutrition, um, regionalized systems of care, and also in health behavior support. There's yeah. social supports, care management, health coaches uh, in the community, um, sort of training those folks up. And we don't have all the answers in the United States. No. We look globally for this. There are so many other places that we're looking at. Okay, and so I'm gonna wrap then with Josh here. I'm gonna wrap back with you. Do the hospitals know that this is what the, the kinds of things they should be investing in? Where do, where do the big healthcare organizations fit in on this? Do they have a clue? You know, again, they don't. Um, uh, about 40% of them feel they do. Uh, I've worked with many of them, and they're, these are good people trying hard. Oh, sure, yeah. no, um, no judgment. <laughs> but it, it, really, it, it, it really is about systematic blind spots sure, in, it's a monster in, of a problem. In, in our in our industry and in you know this is why we kind of have to go back to the hippocratic oath mm -hmm. and remind people what the purpose of medicine is in the first place to start opening the eyes and what we our dream for this really was to start building a new part of the industry honestly you've heard from these guys they're amazing pockets of innovation yep. going on but it's subscale mm -hmm. uh, and we and you know i think the response tonight was 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 a pretty yeah, good sign pretty good. that that's starting to happen. Yeah, we want to harness all the incredible innovation yep. in your hall and start applying it to disrupting the social determinants. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for joining me. It was thank a pleasure to so speak much. with all thank three you. of you. Thank you so much. I'm Jessica Damasa here in the Guidel Insights Lounge at Singularity University's Exponential Medicine. Thanks so much. Thank you.